Whether they refused to give up the fight for ideological reasons or simply were not aware that the fight was over, there were a number of Japanese soldiers who held out long after Japan had formally capitulated to the Allies in the Second World War. Among the most famous holdouts was Japanese commando Hiro Onoda, who remained in the Philippines until 1974. Contrary to what you might have heard, however, Onoda was not the last recorded holdout. That title goes to a Taiwanese Japanese soldier known by many names, the most prevalent being Teruo Nakamura. In this video, we tell his story. During the first Sino-Japanese War in the late 1890s, the Empire of Japan annexed Taiwan. Believing Aboriginal Taiwanese would excel in special forces operations in tropical and subtropical climates, the Imperial Japanese Army started recruiting such men in the lead up to World War II, training them in guerrilla warfare. As many as 5,000 Aboriginal Taiwanese fought for the Japanese throughout the war and one Aboriginal Taiwanese unit which served with distinction was the Takasago Volunteers. While it's unclear whether he was forced to or actually wanted to, Armis Aborigine Teruo Nakamura joined the unit in 1944, shortly after which he was sent to fight in Indonesia. One particular conflict there, the Battle of Moritai, would change Nakamura's life forever. On the 15th of September 1944, a 57,000 man strong allied force composed of American, Australian, British and Dutch troops landed on the Maluku island of Morutai which was defended by as few as 500 Japanese troops at one point. Despite facing overwhelming numbers, the Japanese employed guerrilla tactics and managed to put up a solid fight until the 4th of October. While the Allies used Morotai as a base to launch further operations, a number of Japanese stayed in the jungle and held on, Nakamura among them. On the 15th of March 1945, before the war had even come to an end, Nakamura was declared dead. We of course know that this wasn't the case. Along with some other holdouts who often got around in groups, Nakamura hid deep in the jungle. Throughout 1946 and 1947, he pretty much said to hell with y'all and went off on his own. But evidently that didn't work out for him and he ended up in a group once more. The years ticked by and a little before said group of holdouts was found and repatriated in December 1955, Nakamura went off on his own again, this time for good. With his training and having grown up in the mountains, he made a life for himself in the Moritai jungle. While he had a rifle, knife, helmet, cooking pot and mirror when he set out alone, he otherwise lived off the land, constructing a 3 meter square hut, cultivating fruit and vegetables such as bananas, pawpaw, red peppers, taro, sweet potatoes, beans and sugarcane in a 20 by 30 meter field which he fenced off with bamboo, trapping pheasants and boars and catching fish from a river. He even constructed his own abacus just for fun, because maths is fun, and used the moon to count the days, which quickly added up to years, then decades. According to the Taipei Times, Nakamura wrote a biography later in life, in which he explained what got him through each day. Although I didn't have anybody to talk to, buried deep in my heart seemed to be a glimmer of hope and expectation. The only trace of happiness during this time came from the fact that I was still alive and I hadn't lost my sense of existence yet. Not to lose my life became my only goal, and that exhausted almost all of my time. Without a mindset like that, Nakamura might have lasted a while, but certainly not until the 70s. In mid-1974, a pilot flying over the island spotted Nakamura's crib and a butt-naked Nakamura from the sky, and the information reached the Japanese embassy in Jakarta, Indonesia's capital city, later that year. In November, the embassy contacted the Indonesian government in turn and the Indonesian Air Force on Moritai sent out a plane to search for him. When Nakamura was once again spotted from the air, a group of Indonesian soldiers began a grueling three-day hike through the jungle, finally finding Nakamura's crib, which they later renamed Nakamura City, and Nakamura himself on the 18th of December 1974. As they surrounded him, they sung the Japanese anthem Kimagaya and some other Japanese songs and also carried a Japanese flag in an effort to calm Nakamura before they captured him. 
While Nakamura did not resist arrest, he was incredibly thin and almost too frightened to move. Then, as he was transported away from the jungle into the 1970s, that fear turned to utter confusion. He was, in a way, the Taiwanese Captain America, thrust almost 30 years into a strange and terrifying future. What the hell is even that? Initially, Nakamura recovered in a hospital in Jakarta where he started to come to terms with his new reality. But there was a lot more to take in. First and foremost, his wife, thinking he had died, had gone out and scored herself a new man, and his son, who was just a baby when Nakamura had been sent to fight in Indonesia, was now a full-grown man with children of his own. What was also rather problematic is that Taiwan, Nakamura's home country, was now no longer part of Imperial Japan, rendering poor Nakamura a countryless dead man. The subject of Nakamura's repatriation lingered in the media for a while, but he was ultimately given the choice of either returning to Taiwan or making a life for himself in Japan. He chose Taiwan. As a Taiwanese man, however, he was not entitled to pension from his 30 plus years serving the Imperial Japanese Army, and as a result was only paid out 68,000 yen, which at the time would have worked out to be 227 US dollars. No worries. Following this disgrace, the Taiwanese media kicked up a fuss and managed to squeeze a few million more yen out of the Japanese government, as well as some public donations, totaling 4.25 million yen, which was a little more like it. Unfortunately, Nakamura only had around five years to spend his hard-earned cash. The poor man died of lung cancer in June 1979. According to the Taipei Times once again, Nakamura went on to write, I made one simple wrong judgment and it cost me 30 years. To be a little more specific, Nakamura held out for 29 years, 3 months and 16 days, bidding Hiro Onoda by a few months. But we're interested to hear what you think. Did you know that Hiro Onoda was a scam artist? Had you heard of Teruo Nakamura before this video? Do you know of any other crazy holdout stories from the Second World War? What about beyond it? Please feel free to share your thoughts and RuneScape account information in the comments section below. And just before you head off to that next suggested video guys, make sure you check out our new channel called The Braved, where we go deep into history to find some of the most badass individuals from all different eras. And if you're more so into the music side of things, check out our Relax Jack music channel where we use a lot of the music from that channel and use it in the videos here, including in the intro. And if you want to get access to our behind the scenes discord where you can chat to myself and the team who make these videos and get access to a couple of exclusive videos, check out the Patreon. And if you just want to join us on our wider socials, check us out on Instagram, Facebook and our discord server. Anyways, guys, as always, thank you so much for watching and I hope you learned something new.